the Scottish government recently released some new documents and images relating to the mystery of the Flannan Isle Lighthouse and other local lighthouses that shed some new details into the lives of the three men who mysteriously disappeared under very strange circumstances. Did they go insane from the solitude and paranoia and kill each other? Were they poisoned by the mercury which made them lose all sense of reality? Were they kidnapped by pirates? Or were they simply washed out to sea in a freak accident. Hey everyone, my name is Alan and welcome to Vivid Crackle, where we talk about weird and mysterious things. Today we're talking about a mystery that's over 120 years old and has been one of the most baffling unsolved mysteries out there. Pay attention, here's the story. Though we hunted high and low and hunted everywhere, of the three men's fate, we found no trace. This comes from a poem by Wilfred Wilson Gibson about the unsolved disappearance of the Flannan Lighthouse Keepers in the year 1900. James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur, three experienced lighthouse keepers, went to work at a fairly new lighthouse on the remote island of Aylan Moor, and strangely were never seen or heard from again. The life of a lighthouse worker was not an easy one. According to the recently released registries, the men who worked in them originally would spend six straight weeks locked up in the lighthouses and two on shore. These keepers would often have families that lived in nearby towns, and these families would only see their husbands and fathers in those few days that they would be home. Working in these lighthouses was a huge sacrifice. These men missed massive chunks of their children's lives. Robert Klein, one of the men in this photo, spent seven years and eight months as a lighthouse keeper. The little girl on the far right of this photo is his daughter whom he rarely saw during those years. If if a keeper's wife was pregnant and due to have a baby while he was in the lighthouse, he would look out from the top of the lighthouse to the signal tower in the nearby town. And if a pair of pants was hanging from the tower, the baby was a boy. If it was a dress, a girl. Some of the nicer lighthouses would have a room or a house built onto it so that the families could come and live with the fathers as well. But that was not the case in this story here. The job of the keepers sounds simple. Maintain the fog light and keep the lighthouse in functioning order. But it was a dangerous, dirty, and exhausting job. All three men on duty slept in a 13-foot circular room with a triple bunk bed, only having a curtain for privacy. There was no running water. So to use the bathroom, they would have to walk outside onto the cold, misty rocks and use an outhouse. At night, they would take shifts every three or four hours to make sure the light was continuing to function and that the mechanism that turned the lamp and rang the bells was always in pristine condition. It was exhausting, but times were hard, and these men had to provide for their families. The Flannan Island Lighthouse had only been operational for about a year, and James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur were all on duty in December 1900. There was a fourth man on their team as well, however, he was on land rotation at the time. On December 15th, the steamer ship Archter was passing near the Flannan Islands and was expecting to be signaled by the lighthouse, but the lamp never turned on and the bells never rang. This was strange because the weather was bad, which meant they needed the light more than ever. So the crew wrote this anomaly in their logs. In his poem, Gibson writes the following about this moment. Though three men dwell on Flannan Isle to keep the lamp alight, as we steered under the lee, we caught no glimmer through the night. When the Archter finally docked in Laith on December 18th, the crew passed this information onto the Northern Lighthouse Board for investigation. There was a relief ship, the Hesperus, captained by Jim Harvey, and was planning to go to the lighthouse on December 20th, bringing Joseph Moore along with them to replace one of the keepers. But the weather was still too bad for them to sail, so they had to wait several days and were finally able to arrive around noon on December 26th. When the Hesperus docked at the bottom of the stone steps at the base of the lighthouse, it was immediately clear something was wrong. Nobody was there to greet them, which was the usual custom. They shouted at first, calling for the three keepers to come out, but nobody answered. Captain Jim blew the ship's whistle, Nothing. They launched a flare, but nothing stirred. The provisions box on the landing, which usually had empty boxes of food and supplies to be replaced by the relief boat, was empty. 
Joseph Moore, along with a crew member named Mr. McCormick from the Hesperus, slowly made their way up the 160 steps to the top. When they entered, he said the following, On coming to the entrance gate, I found it closed. I made for the entrance door leading to the kitchen and storeroom, found it also closed, and the door inside that. But the kitchen door itself was open. On entering the kitchen, I looked at the fireplace and saw that the fire was not lighted for some days. I then entered the rooms in succession, found the beds empty just as they left them in the early morning. The table had been set, and earlier reports said that they were planning to sit down for dinner when something happened. But according to Robert Muirhead's report, who was part of the original investigation that was recently released to the public, the pots and pans had just been washed, as well as the utensils, which means it was more likely that they had already eaten and cleaned up and had simply reset the table for the morning meal, meaning whatever happened to them probably happened after dinner rather than before. The oil lamp was clean, filled with fresh oil, and ready to light the room, but it had never been lit. One chair had been knocked over. Joseph also found that one of the three oilskin jackets was still hanging in the room. The other two were missing. This suggested that one of the three men had left in a hurry without taking the time to put on this important piece of equipment. Oilskins were waterproof garments that lighthouse keepers would use when they went outside to protect themselves from the wind, rain, and splashing water. Since this was the cold season in December, there would have to have been a serious reason for one of the men to leave without it. By the way, if you like this, it would mean a lot if you would subscribe to this channel. It really encourages me to know that people are enjoying the content. Thanks. The only sign of life in the lighthouse was a single canary sitting quietly in its cage. And seemingly the most strange of all, the clock on the wall had stopped. During this part of the investigation is where things tend to get a little more controversial. There were several documents found that give some clues as to what happened. The first is rock solid. There's no disputing it. This was released by the Northern Lighthouse Board itself. The lighthouse keepers, they kept a logbook, much like a ship captain would. And the last official report was written on December 13th. However, the crew continued writing little maintenance notes until the 15th of December. Knowing that they ate dinner, but that the steamer ship passed by without the lamp turning on on the 15th, makes it pretty clear that the disappearances happened sometime in the afternoon or early evening of that day. What's controversial, though, are the other log notes that were apparently found. It's been said that there were other notes on the 12th, 13th, and 14th, and that in these notes, Marshall wrote that they were experiencing severe winds, the likes of which I have never seen before in 20 years. Another note claims that Ducat had been very quiet and acting strangely while Donald had been crying. Being so experienced, these notes wouldn't make sense unless they were starting to lose their minds which lighthouse keepers were known for, and we're gonna talk about why in just a moment. The final note on December 15th supposedly said, storm ended, sea calm, God is overall. Now I should say that while these notes have been a big part of the story in the past, they were not included, as far as I could find, in the notes released by the official lighthouse board. And there's been a lot of doubt about their authenticity. After this, Joseph and the other crewmates searched all over the tiny island, looking for any signs of the lighthouse keepers. They found that the western landing was very damaged. There was a box that had been broken with its contents strewn all over the ground. And the iron railing on the path out to the landing, which was 108 feet above sea level, had somehow been ripped out of the concrete. And at the top cliff, which was 200 feet above sea level, the ground had been ripped up all the way up to 33 feet away from the cliff edge. After seeing all of this, Joseph wrote, I did not take the time to search further, for I only knew too well something serious had occurred. I darted out and made for the landing. And it was there that the captain of the Hesperus wrote the following telegraph. A dreadful accident has happened at Flannan. The three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the occasional, have disappeared from the island. On our arrival there this afternoon, no signs of life were to be seen on the island. The clocks were stopped, 
and other signs indicated the accident must have happened about a week ago. The investigation that followed was pretty intense, and there have been all kinds of theories about what happened. I'll give the official theory report in just a moment, but I'll share the more common theories first. One of the most common theories, which even movies have been made about, was that the men went completely insane. Two of them killed a third, and when they went to take the body out to sea in an attempt to dispose of it, they got hit by a wave or even captured by pirates and died either way. This theory actually does make some sense, which is why it continues to be told. Because lighthouse keepers back then, they were known for going a little crazy and not for the reason you'd think. It was because the lamp that needed to spin and provide constant light floated in a pool of liquid mercury, and the friction from the rotation released mercury vapor, and dirt and dust would build up in this mercury over time. And one of the lighthouse keeper's jobs was to strain the mercury through a fine cloth to clean it out. This caused them to breathe in the insanity-inducing fumes the whole time. These lighthouse keepers were exposed to mercury fumes every single day while on duty. And one of the symptoms of mercury poisoning is insanity. Because two of the oil skin jackets were missing, it only added fuel to the mercury and sanity theory. I, of course, have to share the theory of alien abduction or some kind of time warp. The clock being mysteriously stopped has led to a lot of parallel universe type theories. Now, while I love a good parallel universe theory like the time slipping man from Tarred and my other video here, in this case, a stopped clock isn't enough evidence. Considering how old fashioned this lighthouse was, and battery-driven clocks didn't start coming into the mainstream until 1906, it's most likely that this was simply a wind-up clock. Wind-up clocks found in churches, lighthouses, and buildings like them could last up to eight days. So having a stopped clock simply proved that the men had been missing for several days when the relief team arrived. No bodies were ever found, and it's still a mystery. But here is the official theory from Robert Muirhead, the Northern Lighthouse Board Superintendent who conducted the investigation personally and knew all of the men. To give an understanding to the motive as for what I'm about to read, Marshall, one of the keepers, had been fined five shillings before this incident because he had allowed some equipment to be washed away during another storm. The box that was found on the western part of the island contained ropes and other important equipment. So the initial thought is that seeing the storm coming, he probably ran out first without his oil skin on, and the other two men, seeing how dangerous it was, quickly followed him to help. Here's the official theory from Robert Muirhead. From evidence which I was able to procure, I was satisfied that the men had been on duty up till dinner time on Saturday the 15th of December. That they had gone down to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, etc. were kept, and which was secured in a crevice in the rock about 110 feet above sea level. And that an extra large sea had rushed up the face of the rock, had gone above them, and coming down with immense force had swept them completely away. 